Okay, thank you, Peggy. So welcome everybody, uh, Senate Education, and we are at Thursday, April 23rd, 2020. And we have a relatively short agenda today. As I told you last time, the, the House Education Committee was not ready to move forward with the default budget language. So we have tabled that, uh, perhaps indefinitely, but uh, maybe not. But the Act 173 language, they seemed fine with, with a couple of minor uh, tweaks, which I believe Jim has incorporated into the new draft. So why don't we start with a walkthrough from Jim and that language is up on the committee website. And if you wanna go ahead and pull it up, it's draft 4.1. Well, I think we should start with the um, timeline. Okay. Sounds good. So that's in the same spot, if you want to uh, go there. Okay, whenever you're ready, Jim. Okay, so for the record, uh, Jim Gamery, Ledge Console. We're walking through draft seven of this timeline, um, which you've seen many times before. Um, if we go down to the boxes, um, two thirds down, where it shows the fiscal years. Um, just, uh, just to remind the committee that um, originally the census grant was going to go into effect in fiscal year 21. That's the third box in. Um, and then last year, uh, you delayed that start to fiscal year 22. And now you're delaying it to fiscal year 23. Mm -hmm. um, so, the first year of the grant will be fiscal year 23 under this bill. Um, and that actually is not technically a census grant. Uh, that is a grant that is based on the amount that the school districts have historically received in special ed reimbursement. So that first year, we're taking the average of three years worth of reimbursement, fiscal years 18, 19, and 20, uh, we're adding an inflator to it, and that would be the amount that each school uh, district receives uh, the first year. And just to remind the committee what they'll do with that is in that first year, they'll take that amount of money. Let's, well, I won't give examples, but they'll take that amount of money and they'll divide it by their student count. And they'll come out, to, they'll come out to an amount per student. And that amount per student will be different for every school district in the, in the state probably because the amount they got reimbursement will differ by, by school district and the number of students will differ by student, school district. So the amount per student will be very different in that first year. Um, and Jim, just to clarify, so this is ADM not weighted pupils, it's actual bodies. Actual bodies, yeah. Yeah. Okay. ADM, yeah, that's correct. Um, then if we flip over to the very end of the chart in fiscal year 27, uh, we have a uniform base amount. And what that means is, is that all districts at that point will be using the same amount of money per student. Um, and, and it starts in fiscal 27 and it goes forward and there's no inflator on that after it's set. Um, and that's how there's some cost savings potentially in this act. Um, so between fiscal uh, 23 and fiscal 27, school districts are moving toward that uniform amount. So for example, if in fiscal 23, uh, your, your, um, your student uh, per student number was, let's say 2000 per student. And let's say that the uniform amount in fiscal 27 is 3000 per student, you will move up over three years to get to, to that uniform amount. And if you, if you had the opposite uh, set of facts, you move down uh, to get to that uniform amount, okay? So those are the transition years happening in fiscal 24, 25, and 26. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? I no. think it's very clear. The one, the one thing I just wanted to ask about is you've also changed the date for the state board rulemaking. Correct, yep. And um, that's, that's just putting it out a year from where it was after what we did last year. Yeah, originally this date in Act 173 was November 1, 2019. 
Last year was changed to August 1, 2020. Now it's being changed to August 1, 21. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, questions on the timeline? I one further, two further comments, actually, if I could. Um, oh. uh, let, let's let Jim uh, clarify, and then we'll go to Debbie and then Andrew. Okay, the two further things I wanted to mention, one at the very bottom, uh, the, uh, the rules that apply to independent schools were to go into effect in fiscal 23 <coughs> uh, under when Act 173 is passed. Now that's being moved to fiscal 24. So one, okay. one year extension on that too. And the one thing I wanted to mention as well is that the, um, the um, calculation of the uniform base amount, I realized going through this process, there's a problem with the inflator, how, how that number is inflated over time. So I fixed that in the draft we're about to go through. Let me explain the fix. Um, that uniform base amount in fiscal year 27, the very last box, um, uh, it's the average of three fiscal years worth of funding, 18, 19, and 20, plus an inflator, okay? Um, so the problem with that is that you have to know what the uniform base amount is at the beginning of fiscal year 24. You have to know that because you're starting to move toward it in fiscal year 24. So you won't know, if, know what the inflation rate is in fiscal year 24, 25, or 26. You won't know that information, so you can't really set the um, uniform base amount without knowing what the inflator is. Mm -hmm. So I've done this draft, is I've taken the years that we do know what the inflation rate is, I think uh, like fiscal year 21, 22, 23, and I've averaged the inflation rate for those three th those years and used it for the years we really don't know what the inflation rate will be. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. okay. Why don't we Why don't we move to the language? Oh, I'm sorry, Debbie, and then uh, Andrew. Thanks. Yeah. Um. So I was just looking at the the box that says funding for AOE to provide assistance to supervisory unions in adopting best practices. Will that be extended into FY22? Do we need do we need to appropriate an additional amount of funds, or is that kind of uh, included in AOE's budget? Uh, well, that has not been done in this draft. The technical assistance that was given by AOE has been, frankly, I think, widely criticized um, in terms of what they've given. So you could fund more of it, but I think you want to be more specific as to what they have to do. Yeah, and I think that was supposed to represent a kind of ongoing cultural shift. Um, and that's why there's no line. Jim hasn't um, connected it. Uh, it's just kind of supposed to be happening. But I think Jim's right. We've all, all had the sense that it's not happening. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we need to deal with it here, but we need to get when the COVID crisis is over and AOE goes back more or less to normal, we need some kind of firmer commit from, commitment from them. And at that time, it may involve more funding, but um, you know, they're just not accomplishing what's supposed to underlie this whole effort. Um, so let's put that question uh, to the future when we pick up post-emergency. Um, Andy, what was your question? My question is why the years for the average grant are, you know, three fiscal years before the first year of the grant, 18, 18, 20, why aren't they, you know, 2021, 20, 22 or? Well, we could move them forward, but then you're getting into an unusual period, right, with COVID. Um, so the reimbursement rates might be not normal anymore. And whatever years you use, they are being inflated. So the years you use is less important because they will be inflated um, per, per year after that, okay. until you get to the point where it's used. Okay. Yeah, actually, that was the same problem during Irene. All the spending exploded. We had infusions of federal cash, and it made it hard. You had to look before Irene and after Irene to figure out what was really going on. Um, okay, so let's go to the language now. So this is draft 4.1, Jim. Uh, 4.1, correct, yeah. 
and just walk us through and we'll stop you as we need to. Okay, so just go through the statement of, of purpose first. Uh, the bill proposes, due to the COVID-19 state of emergency, to delay the changes to special education funding from a reimbursement model to a census-based model from July 1, 2021 until July 1, 2022, and to delay the requirement that certain approved independent schools enroll students on an IEP uh, from July 1, 2022 until July 1, 2023. Mm -hmm. so section one, uh, if you flip over to page two, and you've seen this, this language numerous times before. Uh, we've been through this before. Some of this is technical changes from AOE. So the first change, um, I don't have lines on my page. My printer doesn't print lines out, so I can't point you to a line. But the first change on page two just clarifies that the three school years we're using for long-term membership are, are for, for the most recent three years for which data are available. That's an Jim, change. Jim, uh, just back to Andy's question. So the most the most recent three years for which data is available would, we do have data that's gonna be available, but it won't be reliable because of Corona? Well, this is for the student count. Okay. You're on for the student count. So this is the most recent student count, three years worth, um, an average of that. Okay. It's the same way you compute AD, ADM. All right, sounds Except good. ADM, when you compute ADM, it's an average of two years. We use an average of three years here. Okay. Okay. Um, and then um, coming down where it says uh, uh, number of paragraph four, uniform base amount, this goes to that definition together. Uh, it says uniform base amount means, um, this is the amount that you're using in fiscal 27, means an amount determined by dividing an amount equal to the average state appropriation for fiscal years 18, 19, and 20 for special education, and then increased by an inflator, okay? Uh, and then divided by long-term membership. So you're basically taking a statewide how much have you spent on special education? You're dividing it by statewide student count, okay? But we're using the base years of, um, of 18, 19, and 20. So it has to be inflated because you have to get from there all the way up to 27. So for the inflator, uh, for each of fiscal years 21, 22, and 23, we'll know what the inflation rate is. So we can use that inflation rate. And then for the years where we don't know what the inflation rate will be, which is fiscal years 24, 25, and 26, we use the average inflation factor for the years we do know, which is fiscal years 21, 22, 23. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, next page. Um, uh, now we're going into um, those boxes on the chart we just went through. So page three at the top says for fiscal year 23, which is the first year of the census grant, of the grant funding, the amount of the uh, grant for an SU will be the average amount received for, for fiscal years 18, 19, and 20, um, uh, and then increased by the inflation factor, okay? That's the first year of grant funding they'll get. Jim, um, if, if I could just ask, so we're into 2020 here, and is that including data from the current situation? No, because that's, that's fiscal year, so that's 1920. Okay, Yeah. as opposed to 2021. If you use 20, fiscal year 21, we'd be coming into this period. Okay. Right? So we're trying to avoid that. Yeah, good move. Okay, um, okay that's that change. Um, and then um, B says, and this isn't change, but just to explain how it works. So you get the amount in year one, 2023, and then you, it says in B, the amount determined under A, the amount that you got will be divided by the SU's long-term membership, three-year average of student count, to determine the base amount of the census grant, which is the amount of the census grant calculated on a, on a per student basis. So this is where you get every SU having a different um, calculation at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the end, so now for fiscal 27, at the very end of, end of this process, in subsequent fiscal years, 
the amount of the census grant for SU will be the uniform base amount multiplied by the SU's student count. Okay. Um, okay. And that does, does not inflate. When it's that's done, it does not inflate. And then in the in-between years for years 24, 25, and 26, the amount of the census grant for SU should be determined by multiplying the SU's long-term membership by a base amount established under this subdivision. But what this language is doing is just moving them from fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 27 proportionally to, to get there. So they're either moving up or down to get to the uniform base amount that's used in fiscal year 27. Well, that gets somewhat confusing, I have to say. Um, I am, I'm just struggling a little bit with, uh, so for instance, on page four, we've gone from 2021 to 2023, 2025 to 2027 on lines five and six. So let's just read that language if we could. Um, yeah. So starting at the top, it says the base amounts for each supervisory union for fiscal years 24, 25, and 26, which are these transitional years, shall move gradually the SU's fiscal year 23 base amount to the, fisc to the fiscal year 27 uniform base amount by prorating the change between the SU's fiscal year 23 base amount and the fiscal year 27 uniform base amount over this three fiscal year period. I get that, but why has it jumped by two years rather than one year? Oh, um, because we because he moved out the start date by two years, right? You, you mean because we delayed a year last year and we're delaying another year? Yeah. So okay. We everything forward by two years. Okay. I I thought we were changing language where we had moved it one year last year. So now this year would there would only be a one year move. No, because th these changes should have been made last year. Ah. Uh, uh, by year, but they weren't made. Right. So, because the collapse of the miscellaneous. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure exactly why. But I wasn't here for that part, but whoever helped with that didn't understand how this all worked. So we're making it up now. Okay. okay. Good. Um, and then, so that's, that's that section. Any questions on that? No, I don't see any. Okay. Okay. Next section are this just technical changes from Ooh, the AOE. Jim? Sorry, Ruth has a question. Oh, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This may be just a, a, an editing question, but in that section that you just read on line two, for example, shall move uh, gradually the supervisory union fiscal year base amount to, it shouldn't, it, aren't there some words missing there? Isn't there a two missing or something? The phrasing is really awkward. We, we need Sarah Ingram, our English professor, to help us. Yeah, no, it's, it's actually right. I mean, I can see, yeah. It reads okay to gradually me. Gradually move the supervisory union's fiscal year to yeah. a different uniform base amount by prorating the change. It, 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 it's right. <laughs> okay. It's, it, it just seems like it's missing words. It, I, <laughs> I, I read but, it a couple of times. I, I think it's. It's not the uh, smoothest uh, construction, but I think it's grammatical. Yeah. Okay. I trust you too. Okay. Uh, and Jim, of course, of course. I think the only people have to understand is you guys and AOE do. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. So, section two are just changes from a AOE. Uh, we've been through these before, but because we're on moving from a uh, reimbursement to a uh, grant system, um, they want to get rid of the word expenditures and costs. That's, those are terms usually used more with reimbursement. So you're moving to the words funding, basically, for funds. Okay. So that's that's a change there. Section three on page five. Um, this is the, the section, again, um, uh, changes by OE. Uh, technical changes, I believe. Uh, there's a 2% bucket that the secretary can use for unusual circumstances. Um, and that 2% bucket under this language is now tied to the amount of the census grant. So it's, it's tied to a different, um, different um, 
source, if you will, because we're moving to census grant as opposed to reimbursement. And Jim, have we um, voted on that language before? On this language? Yeah. No. Okay, so this is new from AOE? Well, it's new, it came in last year, been through last year. I think you wrote it on last year because I think you moved this last year. Okay, so that was my question was, year. okay. And what was it tied to before? I think it's here, it's where it's crossed out. So it's up to 2% of the funds appropriated for special education. So, so that would that would be the the money to reimburse what had already been spent. Yeah, and now they're moving it to the to um, two percent of the census grant. Okay, sounds good. Okay, section four um, is uh, okay. So se se section four came up in House Education. Uh, there's requests that the uh, advisory group have a, a bit more life to it now that these days are being moved out. Mm -hmm. The advisory group is uh, with under, under this language. It was going to cease to exist on June 30, 22. That would move to June 30, 23, one year. Yep. And then the next part about reimbursement, um, it's um, uh, it is allowing uh, them to have up to 12 meetings per year as opposed to eight because they ran out of meetings in the past. Uh, so it allows uh, them to be compensated for 12 meetings per, per year and that will increase the appropriation from 5,300 approximately to 9,000. 9, yeah, this is gonna add at least two weeks if not a month to the passage of this bill because it's gonna have to go through our approaches, their approaches, um, and they're working very slowly these days. This isn't super time sensitive, um, so I don't think it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's it's not a super emergency that it be changed now rather than a month from now. Um, but just so we are expecting that delay, um, does anybody have a problem with extending the life of the advisory panel? Okay, I think they've done very good work, you know, and uh, on the rulemaking, they were very helpful. So I'm fine with it. It's a small amount of money. Um, okay, keep keep going, Jim. Okay, so section five um, uh, extends rulemaking. So last year you did, you changed two dates last year. You changed, you pushed out the, the grant funding by one year and you moved rulemaking by one year. This moves it by an additional year. So it's moving, uh, you moved last year to August 1, 2020. Now it's being moved to August 1, 2021. Okay. Okay. Um, and then section six, uh, again, just moving these dates for, forward by two years. You can see the two year changes here in section six. Um, and uh, the IDA reference is something that came from AOE as a technical, technical change. Mm -hmm. uh, section seven, um, uh, you may recall that 173 um, gave some leeway under the current state board rules to allow teachers to teach students to struggle more as a group rather than just students on IEP. Uh, that's being moved out to uh, two by two years as well. That relief will, will remain in place for two more years. Uh, section eight um, is um, the requirement for. Um, okay, so now we're moving away from the census grant and into the approved independent school part 173. Yeah. Okay? And so there is a requirement that the state board um, uh, initiate rulemaking. Um, to, um, there's a concern about getting approval by, by independent schools for providing services for various, various categories of disabilities and how long that takes. So uh, this language said, uh, says on before June 30, 2021, but moving by two years, the State Board of Education shall review its rules for approved, approving independent schools in specific special education categories and initiate rulemaking to update its rules uh, to simplify and expedite, expedite the approval process. That's been moved by two years. Okay, so Jim, this is, I'm just trying to clarify, this is new language. 
It's yes. all language except for the date change. I see. Okay, so um, what I'm getting at is the independent school folks. Uh, this is part of the agreement that we made at the end of the 173 bill writing process. Do you remember that? Nicole Mace, Patty Comline representing their various people came up with a, a compromise which we put into 173. So this keeps that in place, just changes the date. Yeah, and the concern, what this addresses is the concern that if the approved independent schools are gonna be required to take on special education students, it takes, it takes too much time to get approved for that category of disability. Yeah. So they're trying to find a way to speed that up. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then section well, nine is new Jim, language. Jim, it comes from Jim, John Carroll. Just one right. second. It's just Debbie, go ahead. Yeah. So um, I was trying to understand the why it's gone from November, November 1st to June 30th. Um, it really ties into the date in section nine, which we're about to come to. Um, it was a request by John Carroll okay. for that date. But let me, come, let me come back to that just in one minute if I could. Okay. okay. So section nine, uh, there's a couple of things in regard to state board rules. Um, both of these are uh, requested by John Carroll. First, the oh, one- Jim, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. This was the section I was asking my question about. Okay. Um, so I, I thought we were talking about section nine already, but what I'm wondering is this update to State Board of Education rules, is that language that we have vetted through uh, the stakeholders or is this something that's come straight from the State Board? Uh, straight from the State Board. Okay, so we will need to um, have the stakeholder groups take a look at it to make sure that, uh, or why don't you explain what it does and we'll see okay. how. So, so the first in 9A, let me go back, 173 did not have a date uh, for, by which the school board, the state board had to approve rules for the independent schools. Didn't have a date. Mm -hmm. You had to do that, but you didn't say when. You did say when up in section eight on this one piece that deals with um, um, deals with special education categories, but there's a whole set of requirement you need to update the rules for independent schools to comply with your statute. There's no drone provision in 172 that did that. 9A does that. 9A says that, that there's a date now by which the state board has to initiate rulemaking to implement Act 173. Okay, for independent schools. And the board testified that, or, or if it comes from the board, I guess that speaks for itself, but they would have to begin this work very quickly. Well, it's, um, it's they have to initiate rulemaking on or before June 30, 2021. So they have a whole year. Okay. Because these rules don't come into place now until fiscal 24, in okay. terms of new, new requirements. Um, so that's why 9A is so that's new. Going back up to eight, there was a little piece of rulemaking to do by November one, and we want to align those dates so that they're all, all being done by uh, June, uh, initiated on June third by June thirty or twenty one. Okay, so this is just changing dates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There was there, there was no date. 9A is new. There was no date generally for rulemaking in this area. That yeah. that is new. And then the second issue is in B, they have done uh, rules, um, they've begun the rulemaking process for, um, for the census grant funding, okay? So they've begun that process and they're in the public comment period right now. But that public comment period will run out in the next few months. And John doesn't want it to run out during the COVID emergency. He wants more time for people to be able to comment on the rules. Mm -hmm. so this is extending the comment period on those rules uh, until the end of this year. And then adjusting the other Administrative Procedure Act process accordingly. Debbie? Yeah, thanks. So, uh, you know, I know in that other legislation we were working on, we changed you know, duties between the state board and the AOE. So these are all, but these are consistent with how we changed. Yeah, they, they retained the special ed category. 
of rulemaking. Yeah. Okay, so, I just thought it was worth asking. And, and just a, a note for the committee, I'm still talking with the pro tem about a desire to pass, uh, to make sure we get past the changes we made in statewide healthcare bargaining and the changes we made on the state board. He's given me every indication that there's gonna be an opportunity before we adjourn Cena DA that we'll be able to move those. So fingers crossed that that work will still go forward this year. And then lastly, section 10, which is over on the top of the next page, changes the effective, effective dates of Act 173. So B changes, so section five will take effect on July 1, 2022. Uh, that's how we, we, we're moving that out by, by um, another, another year. And then uh, sections 20A through 21, um, that's the impact school rules that's being moved out by uh, by a year to 23. That's it. So on, on the actual effective date, why, why not have it all take effect on passage? Because one, one through three are the grant funding changes that won't take effect until they take, you, if you did that, you'd be moving to census grant funding today. <laughs> or, right, this, those sections one through three are the ones that put in census grant funding we shouldn't take effect until uh, uh, July 122. We're still under reimbursement for a couple of years, so. I guess, but don't, don't, they use their own discrete dates in those sections, right? So. No, you have change in that law until uh, July 122. Okay. So uh, all that law, doesn't change because you're still under the reimbursement system, current law, until you get there. So you can't have this go effective now or... Right, I was just thinking that in those early sections, those changes each have a date attached to them. So right. I was wondering why... But those dates are all after July 1, 2022. They're all phasing in. No, I understand that, but why, why since they all have a date attached to them that's after passage, why we couldn't just have it all go into effect and then all those dates kick in whenever the date is. Because the language that we're looking at here replaces the entire chapter on special education. Okay, was, right? just it's fine with me. I just was trying to understand what the, uh, the triggering was necessary for. The, chap the chapter on special education today is all about reimbursement, right? So if you change, if you try to layer it, you couldn't really layer it because there's two different systems. Yeah. So okay. I'll switch over at one point. Okay. Well, questions for Jim about uh, any of that language beginning to end. Okay. Looks. I don't. I don't have any other questions. My only question had to do with uh, the language from this uh, from the state board, but that is just a. a a prose version of changing dates. So, yeah. um, so let's see. And I also don't have any qualms about uh, the independent school part of it. So does anybody have an objection to voting this out? Okay, Did, do we still have uh, Jim? No, we lost Jim. Oh, Jim McNeil. Yeah, yeah he had a meeting at 2.30. Um, so we will just reluctantly uh, vote without him. Corey, I believe you're all set up to call the vote, right? Right. Would okay, like so, a motion? so I would entertain a motion for this. So I move that we um, approve um, draft 4.1 of this committee bill um, and recommend it to the full Senate. So Senator Ingram has moved that we uh, move draft 4.1 favorably. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, the clerk will call the roll. He's Oops. muted. Uh, you're muted, Senator Perry. Sorry, Senator Hardy. Aye. Senator Ingram. Aye. Senator McNeil. Senator Parent, yes. Senator Perchlick, yes. Senator Baruth, yes. Senator McNeil, 
That's it. Pass five zero one. Okay, great. So, Jeannie, I'll scan this and get over to you. I don't have a scanner here, so but I'll get it over tonight. Thanks, Corey. Um, and I will uh, report this and try to make it as brief as possible. I will, I will present it as a, a series of confusing date changes um, and then move on. Um, so just a note on, on where we are with the house in terms of this, they, they had a walkthrough with Jim. They suggested uh, at least one change. I have checked in with Kate Webb. So as far as I know, we are locked and loaded to have this go through the Senate to the House. They concur, and I believe our work is done. So not so fortunate on the default budget language. Um, that does not have their agreement. So that will unfortunately idle off to one side. And as far as I'm concerned, we won't pick it up. They, as you remember, they were pushing for um, something more like a 4% inflator on the language, which I have told them was a non-starter for us. I made the argument that our language was a much better uh, outcome for these districts if it kicked in than what's in law. Uh, Chairperson Webb agreed with that, but still would not agree to, to our solution. So we'll put that off to one side. Corey and then uh, Andrew. Uh, does she get the, the fight? So the part I have, I've got friends on the House Committee and what worries me as we enter the summer with our budget issue is I don't think the House Committee really understands the financial situation we're in with, with, with education. And I mean, even when we were on finance last week, it was very clear that the Senate didn't have an appetite for a 26 cent tax increase but I'm not sure the house is quite there. And I think to me, this is just evident that level funding seems like a fair compromise where we are. And yeah. um, I just, I just want to, I don't know, just, and it's hard for you to speak to, but I worry that they just don't get the problem. Well, I, I look, the house committee is composed of very smart people. I think, I think they understand the nature of the difficulties we're in, but they are for reasons that I've never been able to figure out. They're very uh, much in sync always with uh, the superintendents and Jeff Francis. So if you remember the, Ruth and Debbie will remember this, the, the lead bill, the, the problem we had was that Jeff was very silent in our committee and then went over to the house and bid them up uh, in terms of dollar amounts to a point where we couldn't follow them and we wound up in a contentious three week conference with them. So, uh, you know, what I've said to Jeff is, you're so influential and successful that you've now gotten your districts nothing, no change in the law. Um, so I, I imagine at a certain point, they will um, see what we've done as a, as you say, as a good compromise. If they don't, uh, then, Current statute will have to suffice, and we can't we can't make them go along. Andrew, yeah, on that on that point, I had talked to one of our districts that doesn't have a budget and is worried about this, and mentions this issue with the the house not agreeing to our language. That resulted in me getting a call from a member of Ways and Means that said that the the Ways and Means Committee is working with the Education Committee on this issue. Um, so I. They are talking about the of the larger economic issues the state is facing. Yeah. But the the way it was portrayed to me is that they are working on I don't know if I want to call it a counter proposal, but they're working on a on a proposal that that would allow another option. They specifically are concerned about those districts that for no fault of their own, it wasn't that the voters said no, but they just never got a vote out that they are working on a proposal. They think those districts should get treated differently than the districts that actually had a no vote. So I was told they're gonna to be working on kind of our, our language at 100%, but then a different track for 
these districts that never got to have a vote. Yeah, I just, I have a hard time seeing that because, you know, you're still saying we're going to skip the voters. Um, right. And actually Jeff's, Jeff Francis's proposal, as I told you last time, was really to skip the voters, which was to, as he described it to me initially, was to um, give failed budgets uh, another chance and just put them into law, which, you know, I, I thought was, uh, was just really ill-advised. Mm -hmm. I understand the idea that in this environment, voters will be skittish, but, you know, you could say the same thing about a presidential election. If there's an event that happens, it changes how people vote. Um, that's part of the voting process. There's an atmosphere in which people vote. So to say we, we think the atmosphere will prejudice the vote and so we're gonna take away the democratic process, I, I just have a very hard time with that. And yeah, I, I was in, I was just letting you know what they were. No, and, I, and Kate had mentioned that as well. Um, you know, I, I was pretty clear with her that I think this is what we can do. So we'll, we'll uh, just, you know, continue to wait on them. Thank you.